<laughs> All right. You mean you can't believe it's Friday already? It feels like Monday. All right. So we'll continue in uh, this set of lectures on LHC experiment. There are a few slides that uh, we didn't get a chance to go over on Wednesday, which are about the triggering. And I noticed that since Matt was talking a lot about triggering this morning, we better cover the triggering so you have some idea about how exactly the trigger works. So this will be a complement to what he was talking about this morning about the models beyond the standard models. And I'll be talking about how the searches might be conducted. And I hope to give you the idea. Well, first let me say, I'm, I'm sorry if I gave you the impression that the hadronic physics at, at the Hadron Collider was super complicated and too complicated for us to do anything useful. Right? That's not the impression I meant to give. I meant to impress you a little bit with how hard it was, so you'll know the experimenters are working hard. <laughs> but, but it's not impossible at all. Okay? It's, it's very challenging. The, the more complicated the models get, the more challenging it is. But we do know how to remove the pileup. We do know how to account for the underlying event. We do know how to calibrate the jets. So up to some uncertainties, but, but we do know how to do all that stuff. So don't worry about that. We can find Ws and jets and, and standard model Higgs and those things. Now if things get very complicated and you have these extra particles, especially many invisible particles, then things start to get difficult. I mean, we can still make measurements. We'll make measurements and say, aha, when we put two leptons together, this is the invariant mass that we get. Or when we put a lepton and the total missing ET together, this is what we get. But then we may need some help in trying to figure out exactly what that means. Okay. So I hope that's the impression that I'm giving, not, not that things are overwhelmingly challenging or impossible. Okay. By the way, there was a question at, uh, at the break about uh, magnetic monopoles. And uh, the magnetic monopoles that have been searched for so far have electric charge. And the electric charge is given by the Dirac quantization condition. Some of you might know that. So I think it was your question, right? Magnetic monopoles. So, so far, those, those are all assumed to have electric charge. OK, let's talk about triggering at Hadron Colliders, because you've heard about this a lot. What's the big deal about triggering? Well, basically, the big deal is if you look at this cross-section plot, now you've seen it many times. In fact, you can put it up on your door if you're interested in LHC physics. It's a good touchstone. If you look at the LHC plot, or the cross-section plot, up there it actually has LHC and Tevatron. Let's, let's focus over here around the 10 TeV, where we have the LHC. So you see that the total cross-section, that is the total interaction rate between the proton bunches, is up there around 30, should be around 30 millibarns, I think, 30 to 50 millibarns. Um, and then the, the physics that we are probably interested in at the Terra scale, things like Higgs, things like uh, SUSY, things like W and Z plus jets, is down there around the, um, well, for W and Z, it's around the nanobarn range. For the Higgs, much lower. You remember that it was around the 30 picobarn range, right? How can we make sure that we are recording these events whenever this rate is so high? Well, what's the real problem? You might say, no problem. Just write everything down to, to the tape, and then you can go back and look at it later. Go back and look at it, and you can filter out the new physics that you're looking for out of just the, the standard model collisions that are happening all the time. Here's the problem. The problem is, well, there are actually two problems. One is that we can't write to the disk or the tape fast enough, but th the real limiting factor is just how much money you want to spend for the disk. Okay? If we're writing out these huge events that are coming from the Hadron collisions and reading out all the channels in these gigantic detectors, you have to set some limit. You can't just be buying a, a terabyte of disk every day. Okay? Uh, well, you could, but you know, or actually even more than that, right? Okay, I shouldn't say a terabyte, I should say a petabyte. I can't be buying it. Okay. So what you need to do is you need to make some reasonable uh, limits on what data you're writing. So if you work uh, there, you actually need to work backwards and forwards. So working backwards, you might say, we would like to write out, let's say, approximately 200 hertz. So 200 events per second to the disk. If I say tape, it's because I'm thinking back in the days when we really did write to tape. Let me say disk. So 100, 100 hertz is what comes out at the end of your selection. That's what you can actually write. Anything that doesn't make it into that 100 hertz doesn't get written out, and you just lose it forever. On the front end, the problem is that some of the detectors, especially the ones that have millions and millions of channels, like the silicon detectors. The silicon detectors have about 80 million channels in Atlas. 
sure it's much more in CMS. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but s since CMS has a bigger silicon tracker, it must be bigger. So it takes some time to read out all those channels. And you can't read them out fast enough for the bunch crossing rate at the LHC. So the bunch crossing rate, if you think back, was 25 nanoseconds. Every 25 nanoseconds, we have the bunches crossing, so 40 megahertz. So 40 megahertz is the crossing rate. Now, do we get an interaction for each one of those? What do you think? You might say, oh, we don't get an interaction for everyone. I told you that at the peak luminosity that we're expecting to have pile up under each one of our physics events. Okay, so we're expecting to have pileup. So we have some interaction. I said we have 20 pileup interactions underneath every one of our interesting physics events. So that tells you that even the bunch crossings that don't have interesting physics events also have those 20 pileup interactions. So we're getting something coming out of the detector for every single bunch crossing. How do we filter that out? Basically, we need to make some choices. So we need to make some choices very fast for each bunch crossing, we need to decide whether we had something interesting happen during that bunch crossing. And then the next one comes 25 nanoseconds later and we have to decide again. Okay, so some of you might do the math and say 25 nanoseconds is pretty darn fast because think about how fast light will travel. If I have 25 feet of cable, I won't be able to make the decision that fast, will I? And you know that the muon chambers are, are far away. The muon chambers are more than 25 feet away, so how do we do it? Well, I'm just saying that you have to make the decision in 25 nanoseconds. I'm not saying that you have to make the decision 25 nanoseconds after the event takes place. You may actually time shift it and make the decision longer than 25 nanoseconds after, but you have to make a decision every 25 nanoseconds. So uh, how do you make that decision? Basically what we're looking for is we're looking for some big amount of energy in the detector or uh, an electron leaving a deposit in the calorimeter or a photon or a muon. So we have a set of things that, that we can read out very fast and we can decide whether that was something interesting happening in the event. Let me take this question. Yes? Sorry, this might be a very dumb question, but uh, say that you need to make a decision in 95 times a second. 25. Great question. So here's the way it works. So every one of our, our readout chips, at least for these detectors that don't get read out right away, have what's called the pipeline. So inside the pipeline, you have a set of cells. Let's think of it this way in just a, a crude structural form. Okay. So you have a, a length of cells. It might be 20 long. It might be 40 long. It might be a, a different number depending on the detector. For each event, the information inside here is keyed by what's called the bunch crossing. So we're able to keep track of the individual bunch crossings, basically the 25 nanosecond ticks of the clock. So a 25 nanosecond tick happens, and you put the information that you, you would read out during that tick into this bucket, into this box here in your pipeline. Okay, this is the pipeline. And then the next one comes, and you push it in there. So this might be number one, this might be number two, number three, and so on. So this is for the detectors that don't contribute necessarily to the trigger decision, which we'll talk about in a second. So let's say I am able to take a trigger decision and I'm able to say the trigger decision from level one says read out everything that happened during bunch crossing number three. So then what happens is the Hardware goes in and looks to see what was in number three, takes that information, and then passes it down the line. Okay. And this is just being continually overwritten. Whenever we get to the end, if the end is number 40, we just wrap around to number one. Okay. What's your, what's the so it depends on the detector. For the silicon detectors, it's something like 40 cells long in the pipeline. So you can do the multiplication here, 40 times 25 nanoseconds. Can I do the multiplication? It should be a nano to microsecond, right? Okay. So a microsecond is enough time for you to make a decision in custom hardware, right? Usually it's a, an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, or fast electronics in any case. Okay, let me show you exactly what I mean by that. So these are the, the trigger systems for Atlas and CMS detectors. Let's talk about the, the Atlas detector first. So the detectors which can be read out very fast and which can contribute to the decision within that one microsecond are the calorimeters. So you remember 
the calorimeter design was even dictated by how long we could let the ions drift in the gap and how quickly we could read it out. This is why. This is why that timing uh, detail is set. The muons and the tracking chambers. Okay. So from an interaction rate, which is at, um, uh, well, the bunch crossing rate at 40 megahertz, we have to decide what is the most interesting 75 kilohertz of events coming out of that. Okay, so that's where the first filter happens. And you say, how do we decide what we want? Well, like I said, if you have a high PT muon, we already saw many examples of a high PT muon being a strong sign of interesting physics, especially Terra scale physics. Okay, so those are definitely events that you want to keep. High PT electrons, high PT photons, very high PT jets, very high ET jets, I should say. So if you have a jet that's 200 GeV or 300 GeV, that's definitely something interesting. You'd like to keep that. Now, it's not to say that all these events are necessarily new physics. We know that there are backgrounds, and the standard model produces these same signatures. But what we're going to do is we're just going to let slide off the table things like 5 GeV jets or 1 GeV electrons that might be produced in the collision. Okay, Those aren't necessarily very interesting for us. So after that, the information about which events are, are interesting at this first level, level 1, gets passed to the next level called level 2. Level two, we can afford to take our time a little bit. And the reason is that level two is a massively parallel computer farm. So we can just farm out one event at a time to the computers in that farm. And if we have enough computers, we can take our time. And, and well, you can see even the, so what it gets uh, taken down to after level two is one kilohertz. Now at level one, you have to do things so fast, you can't really reconstruct tracks, or you can't really reconstruct a, a cluster in the same way that, that we've been talking about, or a jet. All you can do is afford to look for big splash of energy. Okay? You don't do a cone algorithm or something fancy like that. You just say big splash of energy in the calorimeter, that might be a jet. Big splash of energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter, that might be a, a, an electron or a photon. But level two is where you can apply some more sophisticated algorithms. So you make another cut down to one kilohertz there. And then the last uh, level, you could call it level three, or you could call it the event filter, takes us down to 200 hertz. That's also a parallel form. So Atlas has this three-level structure. The CMS structure, I put up here for, for contrast between the two. The level one idea is, is pretty similar. So you can see it takes the rate down to 100 kilohertz. But the difference is there's only one more level after that. So CMS has this HLT, high-level trigger. And the high-level trigger, again, is a processing farm but it has to accept the events at this 100 kilohertz and then knock the rate down to the 200 hertz. So it does that all in one step. That's a very massive computer farm and a big switch that's that switching network that's distributing all those events at 100 kilohertz of the computing farm. That's very impressive. Okay. So trigger and signatures. What, what exactly kind of algorithms do we put inside these triggers to do the filtering? So yes, question first. Shall I go back? Uh, you can finish with that. Okay. Uh, so sometimes the impression I usually get when I hear talks about this is that if you don't make it all the way through, it's just thrown out. That's absolutely true. Okay, so there's not even a, because it seems like there could also be something where you could sort of record only the crude features of it. And if, uh, if that's not even a question, I don't know, there's no energy uh, or something like that. Right. So you don't have to record every single one of those little things that went into it. Right. So we try to be loose enough that we don't miss anything that would be interesting. And, and so when I say we're throwing things away, we're really throwing things away that, that are, number one, not interesting, and number two, probably coming at a very high rate. I should be careful when I say not interesting. When I say something like 5 GeV electrons, the 5 GeV electrons are interesting, but luckily they're produced at a very, very high rate. So it's not that we won't get a lot of those events. It's just that we'll have to control what fraction of them we get. So just to give you an example, we are interested in looking at the, the jet events, the die jet events. And those, if those die jet events come with a cross-section that is or around, I don't know the die jet cross-section off the top of my head. Maybe I should just say a, a minimum bias event with tracks in it, low PT tracks in it. So we know that the cross-section for that is around 50 millibarns. Well, if we only get one thousandth of those, that's still a lot of events. That's still a very high rate. Mm-hmm. 
No, in fact, we'll be able to see it because what I'll be describing here is we, ha we are focusing on those events that do have high energy in the detector. Yeah, but this won't get a sense of how typical Okay, so we will get a sense because even if we are accepting just a fraction of a certain signature of event, let's say these digit events, let's say we accept one out of a, one out of a, a thousand of these digit events, the cross-section, the original cross-section, before we scale it down by a factor of a thousand is so high that even after we scale it down by a factor of a thousand, we'll still get a lot of them. So we'll still see them. The only thing we have to be careful of is we have to remember that we scaled it down by a factor of a thousand, or what's called the prescale. So then whenever we make a distribution comparing those events with the events from another trigger that didn't get scaled down, we have to remember to multiply them by a thousand to reflect what really happens in the detector. So the key is just making sure that we have a representative population and make sure that we're not spending all the bandwidth on the very high rate interactions. Okay, question, Victor. That's absolutely, that's exactly what we do. So we do have one trigger signature, which is called the zero bias, so a completely random trigger. And that's done just to make sure that we are, yeah. right, we're measuring what's happening independent of any trigger bias. The trigger is working, we're, we're measuring the noise. It also gives us a good way to, um, to investigate what's happening in the detector, even if it's not an interesting event. Right, that we can measure the noise that way. So yes, we have the random triggers. There was another question up here. I'm just curious uh, how much data is accessed in that estimate. That's, I mean, 200 or so, what does that translate? You know what, I should know this number off the top of my head, but I'm afraid I don't. The, the answer is clearly uh, hundreds of megabytes, but it, it might be more. I, is that a second? Per event. <laughs> times, <laughs> times 200 hertz. <laughs> Let me look up the numbers afterwards. I, that number sticks in my head, but uh, and, and certainly I'll put it in the notes then before I, I post them online. Okay. Any other questions about that? Yes, this is very impressive. So this is how we drink from the fire hose of the data. Okay. Great. But it is absolutely true that if it doesn't make it through, look, the only things that make it to level two are the things that pass level one. The only things that make it to event filter are the things that pass level two, and the only thing that goes to disk is the things that pass all three. We do have special cases where we look, for example, skip level two and, and just pass it through without looking at it, just to make sure that level two is working the way that we expect. Okay. So we do have these cross checks in place. Oh, yes? What's the limiting factor of the case that you The 100 kilohertz? Yeah. So the 100 kilohertz is partially limited in, in how fast the electronics can be, I think, at the level one. Because like I said, you're making that decision well, you can see what the decision is for 100 kilohertz. What would that be? 10 nanoseconds, if I'm right, right? 100 kilohertz is 10 to the 5. So 1 over that, yeah, 10 microseconds. Um, yeah, that's one limitation. I guess the other limitation must be how fast you can actually, what you can accept in the level 2. Okay, so you do have a lot of computers, but you don't have an infinite number. So that actually has to set, I mean, you have to do some compromises for economy. And that 200 hertz is basically set by CERN. Uh, yeah, but I guess if the experiment said, hey, we'll be happy to buy CERN another tape drive or another disk drive to, to put more events on there, that would be fine. But 200 hertz is fine for us right now. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the signatures. What's an example of a signature? Because Matt has emphasized that if we don't make a trigger that will select the events or will pass the events that, that are these new physics events, then we'll never see them. We'll never be able to analyze them. We'll never be able to make these distributions that I'm going to show you in a second, and we'll never be able to discover them. So we have to make sure that there is a specific trigger signature that these events will fit into. So for example, one, one example of a trigger signature is a high PT electron. And at level one, remember level one is only calorimeter. You say, I have a blob in the, in the electromagnetic calorimeter. It's a high energy blob, 23 GeV. Okay, so let me pass that event on to level two. Remember level two, I can read out the tracking detectors, the silicon detectors, and I can run it 
a simple tracking algorithm. So I run a simple tracking algorithm. I find there's a track pointing to that electromagnetic cluster. Great, so I know it's not a photon. I know it's a, an electron candidate. And I can do some more cuts to make sure that's not a pi zero. Remember I said a pi zero and an electron look a little bit different just in the first shower because the pi zero looks like two photons and the electron hasn't looked like two photons yet, hasn't radiated a photon yet. So at this point, level one plus level two, we have an electron candidate. Now the question is, this electron trigger is already there for ATLAS and CMS. Will your physics, or your events that are, that are coming out of your model, pass this trigger? This is one of, of about 256 triggers in, in the ATLAS software. So if you're looking for Higgs to ZZ, where one of the Zs decays the high PT electrons, great. Remember, you don't have to get all the objects in the event. You just have to make sure you get at least one. So any event that has at least one high PT electron, Ws, Zs, a top quark that decays with the W decaying leptonically, all these things would be picked up by this electromagnetic trigger, this electron trigger. So if you, can, if you have one of these in your event, no problem. It will be picked up by the experiment. Okay. Another example is a tau pair. Now, if you were looking for taus, just uh, Z to tau tau, for example, would the, the taus pass the electron trigger? Well, the taus would pass the electron trigger only if the tau decayed leptonically, right? And only to an electron. But maybe we can do better. So here we have a, a tau trigger where we require, uh, on one side, an EM cluster. So this is the level one, so an electron cluster, 14 GeV. And then a tau, so tau ET, transverse energy for the tau, 50 GeV. So this tells you that we do have tau objects in the trigger already that we can say, aha, tau object. So if you have tau objects in your event, they will also be picked up by the trigger. So I haven't put some of the things on here that won't be picked up by the trigger, but Matt mentioned some of them today. If you have something that is an electron that comes out maybe of a conversion partway through the detector with no track, no track in here, you'll get the electromagnet cluster but you won't get the matching track. So it won't pass that electron trigger. There's no track in here because the electron comes from somewhere. Um, there are more subtle things too. Matt mentioned that if you have a displaced photon that doesn't appear to point back to the primary vertex, that often things like that won't pass the triggers. The triggers are really expecting things to come from the primary vertex. So it's very good to ask your experimentalist friends, I have this model and, and there are these particles that are supposed to come out. Let me tell you what the physics signature is. Do you think that your experiment will trigger on this? Will your experiment be able to see it? That's really the only way to do it. Okay? The, the trigger is complicated enough and detailed enough and frankly not, not all the details of the trigger are necessarily published or if they are, it's hard to keep up with how it's developing. So the good thing to do is to ask your, your friends at your institute. Okay, actually that's all I have to say about the trigger now. I, we could have a long discussion and even have several lectures on the trigger. The thing to remember is that the trigger is really the key to the Hadron Collider. If you don't get the events triggered on, then they're completely lost. And I think that's something that, that uh, the community has really appreciated over the past few years. Maybe it wasn't obvious to everybody at first, but now people are really taking it to heart. So what that means is that when you have a new model, you do have to think a little bit about what the physical signature will be. You can't just assume that it will be found at the LFC because the cross-section is large. It really has to be a, a, a physical signature. Okay, were there any questions? I don't think so. I just yes, comment. or a comment. I It will look like a photon, right? But if you have a muon coming out from somewhere, the muon trigger will acquire a track that goes back and forth. Right. Uh, that's true. Um, there, there are, just for your, your education, there are some shower cuts in there right. that kind of require all the photon energy to be in the same tower and things like that. So it's not even clear that they all would pass the trigger. but. Actually, I should talk to you about that, Matt. That's one thing we're studying. Okay. So let me move on to the, the searches then. So now we'll move on to the experimental side of the searches for new physics. And um, 
The searches for new physics are tricky because we have the tendency to start off with the things that are the easiest. And it doesn't mean they're the things that are necessarily correct, as you saw from, from Matt's lecture this morning. And so what happens is, honestly, we start out with easy things, and we move to more complicated things. And eventually, we get to the very complicated things. And uh, we plan not to run out of steam before we can check the, the complicated pos possibilities, too. OK, but there are two ways to go about it. One way is that you have a very specific model in mind. We looked at this case yesterday. We said, we know everything about the standard model Higgs boson, save one parameter, its mass. But we know how it couples. We can figure out exactly what the physical signature should be. We can figure out exactly what the signal event rate should be. So in that case, we could tailor our analysis to the, the few channels that the Higgs was going to, to manifest in the detector. But that's not always the case. We don't always know the model exactly. Or even if we think we know the model exactly, we might be fooled, as we saw this morning from that. So the problem is that instead of trying to chase down the signature for every model and every set of parameters, every combination of parameter values in every model, what we'd like to try to do is we'd like to move towards a more general kind of search. In other words, look for lepton resonances, even if we don't know right at the beginning exactly where they come from. Look for digit resonances, even if we don't know whether they're coming from extra dimensions or SUSY or any of these other models. So from the experimental point of view, it's much more efficient for us to do things that way, rather than have one student, one model, one analysis, one limit, or one. Right? So what I'll be talking about today are mostly focusing on these signature-based searches. And by signature-based, I mean things like lepton, invariant mass, or a, a lepton resonance, a dijet resonance, um, a missing ET plus lepton resonance, things like that. So this is going to be a necessarily incomplete tour, but I hope to give you some idea of the kinds of things that people are, are working on. And I should emphasize that if you have a search like this that's general, I think it's fair to say that it's not as powerful as a search that someone would put six months or a year into developing for a very specific model. In other words, we gain if we have a model that we're looking at and we can figure out exactly how to tailor the analysis for that model. But that's not always possible. So this is a repeat of what you saw this morning, just to make sure that everyone remembers that gluinos are heavy and uh, that the, the neutralinos are light. So Matt already covered this this morning. He didn't mention the Higgses. And uh, I, I guess maybe we mentioned in some of the lectures earlier that there are these five Higgses in the to Higgs doublet model for, for Susie. And this Higgs is a very low-lying Higgs. Actually, the Higgs in some of these cases, in some of these M sugra spectra, might be the, the LSP. But we don't usually talk about them that way, I guess. Well, it's not the SP. It's not the SP. Right, thank you. Good, OK. OK, how can we look for these? Well, the key is this. And um, I'm not sure we focused on this in entirely this morning, but we are producing, whenever we draw these diagrams that, that Matt was drawing this morning, we are producing two massive particles if we are, through strong production, producing these two gluinos. If each one of these gluinos is on the order of, as I've drawn here, 800 GeV, that's 1.6 TeV of, at least, of energy that's going into this S hat. Okay, so the, the scatter there. That 1.6 1, 1 TeV, that is more than, almost more than the, the colliders that we've had up to now. So this is a huge amount of energy. This is a striking signature that something new is happening, producing these heavy particles. Now, these massive particles decay, and that's the thing that we actually see. So you're, I'm just going to draw them as generically as this cascade decay here. But he gave a very complete description this morning. So what we see is out here. But by adding all this together very roughly, we'll get more energy out here if these are massive than if they're light. So they're light in the standard model, and they're massive here in these um, new physics models. So just summing up the total event energy is one way of trying to, to see that we're producing these high mass particles. So you might say, great, let's just sum up all the energy, actually all the transverse energy, 
of the event. Let's just add up all the energy I see in the detector. Isn't that a good idea? Well, it might not be such a good idea because what the detector sees is it sees everything, including the pile-up events, including the underlying event, including all the, um, the interactions that might be coming from the cavern background, everything. So what seems to be a much better idea is instead of adding up the total event energies, it's kind of blindly like that, is to try to add up and create a new variable. Matt mentioned the variable called HT, which was adding up all the physics objects. And by physics objects, this really means, Matt, remind me of your definition. I think it's jets. Uh, it's actually the ET of jets, leptons, missing ET. So this is kind of funny, because you're treating missing ET as an object that has some ET. Was there anything else, or was that it? Good. Okay. What else is there? Well, there are photons in particular. You could add in the photons. I, I don't know if most people add in the photons or not. But be careful whenever you look at the definition of HT. It's different things for different people. Um, there is also a definition that has been introduced for SUSY searches called the effective mass. And so this idea, this definition of effective mass gives you a clue that it's somehow giving you a proxy to the mass scales of these particles here. The effective mass is defined as the sum over ET of the four leading jets. If you, so even if you have five jets, just take the top four and the missing energy. Now here you might say, why not the leptons? The, the motivation for not putting the leptons is, is this thing can be calculated whether or not you have leptons in the event and can be compared between events that do or don't have, a le uh, don't have leptons. So it's just the jets and just the missing energy. OK, what can you do with that effective mass? There's a question here first. Yes? This ET for jets is uh, before calibration or after calibration? Should be after calibration, because even though I showed you all the information about how we do the calibration, what you should see and what we should use in the analysis should be, of course, calibrated. So I showed you the, how we calibrate and what happens before we calibrate, just to show you how important calibration is. But we'll always use the calibration whenever we do the analysis. Yeah, that's the correct thing to do, right? Good. OK, here's an example of what it looks like. So this is a, a very famous plot, a striking plot showing you the difference between the effective mass for the standard model contributions, which are things like TT bar, W plus jets, Z plus jets, um, and QCD here means just die jets. So QCD here means kind of a generic term. Isn't this all QCD since it's all gluon fusion? QCD here means very specifically the die jets that come from the standard model diagram, where these could also be, be quarks. But this kind of die jet QCD, possibly with radiation <laughs> coming off of these legs. Okay, This would give you four jets. That's what QCD is. So you can see all these standard model processes have a relatively low effective mass compared to the SUSY process. And this is a SUSY process that has those hundreds of GeV, 500 to 800 GeV gluinos. You know, on Matt's plot, he even said up to 2 TeV in some cases. So if you can, I mean, this is what you would really see in the detector when you calculate this effective mass if you are lucky enough to be producing these high mass gluinos at a high rate. So that would be pretty good. You can see that the, all the standard model falls in this peak, and you would see a shoulder coming off, and that shoulder would tell you that there's some new physics. OK, what do you do after that? You know, We were talking a lot about how you would measure spins and how you would measure masses and things like that, how you would make sure that it's supersymmetry. Well, first thing, you have to show that there's something new. And this would be one of the first plots that people will make to check to see if there's something new. Notice at this point that we're pretty, we don't know too much about the parameters. All we know is that something heavy is being produced, something truly massive is being produced. We don't even know that it's supersymmetry. It could be some other model of, of heavy particles being produced. OK. We can also look beyond just the total event energy. We can look for resonances in leptons, in photons, in jets. Um, this is one of the easiest things that you can do. I already said that we will have calibrated the electrons and the muons and the photons. 
Well, how about if we find two leptons in the event, let's say two muons, we take the invariant mass of the two muons. A lot of times we'll get the z mass. But what if we have this distribution where this is the mll, so we can do it for electrons or muons, or even for taus, actually. So let's say that it comes down here. This is our line shape as we know it today. But let's say that we get out to 1.5 TeV, and all of a sudden, there's a bump out there. Okay, That would be pretty exciting. That would be pretty exciting. Now, there was just a result that came out from Fermilab, I think, a couple days ago, where they put a limit saying, we already looked everywhere below 1 TeV, and there's nothing there. So we'd have to go up above 1 TeV. Um, so this would be exciting. This is something that's fairly simple to do, just find the, the leptons and put them together. What limits us here? The thing that limits us here is the reconstruction resolution. I actually have something about that in a few slides, so let me, let me get to that in a few slides. You can see on this plot exactly how easy it might be. So with certain models, certain models that predict a certain resonance, a certain W prime resonance, um, and I guess I shouldn't call it W prime or resonance exactly. Well, I guess it is kind of a resonance for, no, it's not a sort of scattering resonance. So uh, it's a, a massive particle that will be easy for us to see. So under certain models for the W prime, people have predicted that we could see a W prime at 1 TeV even with a few inverse picobarns of integrated luminosity. And few inverse picobarns is, is next few months. That's a few inverse picobarns. Okay. So there's a chance to see something like this at a very, in very early data. People have been asking, when can the discoveries come? Okay. This is one of the prospects then for early discovery, if it's there. Okay. So this is very easy for something like electrons and muons. We know how to take the invariant masses. Uh, you know the, the kinematic formula for invariant masses because we know the four vectors of all the objects. What if we have something like missing ET and we don't know the four vector of the object? I mean, here for the Ws, we don't really know the four vector of, of that object. How do we do it? We'll come back to that in a second. Let me say something about the origin of the resonances. And Matt touched on this this morning, too. I thought it was very interesting for him to talk about the motivation for higher mass standard model partners in many different models, across many different models. So one of the motivations that he talked about was this idea of having the loop cancellation. Something, some partner, can be arranged to cancel the the contributions from the Z, from the W, from the top. There are other sorts of resonances that we could get, in particular if we have compactified extra dimensions. You know that you have the, the particles essentially confined in a box in that dimension, and so you have tower of energy states of those particles. So you would have these Kaluza-Klein towers that I've written there. So there are lots of places you can get the resonances, and at the beginning, we don't really care which model they're coming from. First we want to discover these resonances and then we'll try to figure out what model they're coming from. So we're trying to be model blind at this point. Okay, what if one of them is invisible? That is, what if we don't have a full vector, full four vector, for some of the decay particles? Here are two examples of cases where you would have a two-body decay, which in principle you could find by taking the invariant mass but somehow you're missing all the information, all the kinematic information for one of the daughter particles. So it could be SUSY where you're missing the information for the neutralinos because they're the LSP. It could be something like a fourth generation lepton. So these fourth generation leptons are heavy. They want to decay down to, their, to the, uh, the neutrino, a massive neutrino, and the W just through the, the, the weak interaction of their doublet. But these neutrinos, obviously, even though they're massive, are, are not observed in the detector either. So in this case, the simple invariant mass that we wrote down really won't work. What can we use instead? So people have done a lot of work trying to figure out what uh, could be used, going back, in fact, to the first case of a two-body decay to an invisible particle, which was the W, W to E nu, W to mu nu. And at that time, people figured out that you could still get the mass of the W. You could still figure out what it was by using these special variables. So Matt alluded to this this morning. This is just an expansion on what he talked about with the transverse mass. Uh, here's the definition of transverse mass. So you notice it's exactly what you would expect if you were writing down the mass itself, but everything is in the transverse plane. 
It's the ET of the particles instead of the E. And it's the angle in the azimuthal angle only, the change in the azimuthal angle only. So it really is, if you're looking down the beam line, it's really the angle between, let me draw it as I'm missing here, it's really this delta phi change in the azimuthal angle. You might say it's kind of surprising that that even works like that. Well, it works great. So Matt mentioned that if you were just to take a, a naive picture and try to measure the transverse momentum of the observed particle, namely the electron in this case for the w to e nu decay. Oh, I didn't say this is w to e nu, but it is w to e nu. If the w is at rest, that's great. It turns out that the transverse momentum of the lepton is the same as the transverse momentum of that invisible particle. Actually, there you can calculate. You, you would see that the end point here is half the W mass, and, and you would be able to calculate the W mass. But if the W ends up being boosted, here's a PT of 50 GeV, then you have the possibility for the electron to be going along the direction of the W to be boosted like that. Am I saying this right? Yeah, to be boosted in the direction of the W. And so you can easily go past what you would expect to be the end point. By contrast, if you look at the transverse mass over here, the transverse mass is the same, basically, whether you have zero PT or a large PT. So even if it's boosted, you'll still recover the same transverse mass. That's the whole point of the mass, right? The, the mass itself would also be invariant. Okay. Now, how do you figure out what the mass is? Well, the, the cutoff here, the end point there at 80, gives you a hint. That edge tells you where the, where the mass is. Okay. Matt actually mentioned, I think, what this high side was, but I can't remember what he said. What did you say? what this stuff is here? I can't remember. Okay. I won't either. I won't either. Okay. So let's try another approach. Notice that this here, if you look at this kinematic equation here and look at the particles that I'm using, these are a massive object decaying to mass less daughter particles. And that's definitely not the case of what we have in these two physics reactions that we had here. So we may well have physics reactions where we have a two-body decay into massive invisible particles, like the neutralino or these massive neutrinos. What do we do with those? So people have invented all sorts of new kinematic variables to try to take that into account. One of them that came out in the, in the past 10 years is this modified transverse mass. Um, and basically what this is doing is acknowledging that there's some missing energy in the event. So in, in this particular reaction here, we have two neutralinos carrying away the missing energy. How do we apportion the missing energy between these two? How do we figure that out? Well, the apportioning of the missing energy between the two actually depends on the mass of those neutralinos. If we fix the mass of the neutralino, we can define, we can scan over the possible apportion, apportionment of the missing energy and calculate the missing, calculate the transverse mass for each each situation. So that's what we have up there. So up there you're taking the, the larger of the two transverse masses, but you're minimizing over all the different combinations of missing energy one and missing energy two, corresponding to the energy that two neutralinos have taken away. It must add up to the total, so you're basically trying all different combinations. Yeah. So if you do this right, and in fact if you, if you know the neutralino mass first, you can look at the endpoint of this distribution, just like we did for the W, and you can figure out what the, the mass is of the parent particle. My L's didn't quite work out the same here. Let me show you what I mean. So this L here is supposed to be this L up here. So you can calculate what the mass of this is, even though it decayed to two massive particles, especially a massive invisible particle. So this is what you would see for 30 inverse femtobars. It's not easy to find this midpoint. And the limit of infinite statistics, basically infinite statistics, is this uh, solid line here, which I think is 500 inverse femtobars, a lot of data. You have a, a midpoint that is very easy to see. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to tell you how we're going to build up. Let's assume that we see something at the beginning, whether it's from resonance or from this effective mass distribution. How can we build up information about the particle masses that are in the spectra as we see it based on these decay chains? Another way to do that is to look at some kinematic edges for other distributions. So here we have an example of a distribution where the, uh, the slepton is decaying to a neutralino lepton. 
And let's say this is GMSB, where the neutralino decays to a gravitino and a, and a photon. How can we figure out then what the what the um, the neutralino masses are? How can we figure that out? Well, what we can do is we can try to make some distributions and look at the edges, look at the endpoints of the distributions. So if, let me take the one on the, the right first, which is a little bit easier. If we look at all the different combinations of the minimum mass between the two leptons and the photon. So the two leptons and the photon are at the end of this decay chain here. Even though we don't measure the gravitino itself, we can still get some information about the mass difference between the neutralinos. And the reason is that at the end point, the gravitino is basically taking away zero energy. So at that end point, we have a real measurement of the difference, the mass difference between these two neutralinos. So if you, if you like, you can fit this dotted line to make sure that the end point works out even better. And let me say another thing here. You may notice that there doesn't seem to be any background in this distribution. We were always talking about the background that you could fit eventually. Well, here it looks like it's completely flat. How is that? Look at what I've plotted on the, look at what's been plotted on the vertical axis. On the vertical axis, it says E, E plus mu, mu minus E, mu. Okay. So the idea is here that the, if the two leptons are really coming from this signal because of flavor, um, because of lepton number conservation, you'll have to have for a signal same flavor leptons. So two electrons or two muons. If you're somehow just picking out leptons, but they're not coming from signal, they could equally, they'd be equally likely to be this E mu sort of background. So by subtracting out the E mu, you automatically are subtracting out the background contribution. And the proof of that is that you can see it baselines at zero here on this high tail, on this high, high side. Now to make that work, you'd like to have a lot of events. This is for 10 inverse femtobarn of data to make sure that it really does even out to zero instead of fluctuating around zero. Okay, and now we can move over here. Here's an edge that is cleaner physically. It's just the invariant mass of the two leptons, but maybe slightly more difficult to interpret theoretically. It's a little more complicated expression there. But in principle, if you're able to build the things up, you have the neutralino mass difference, and now you have an expression, this endpoint here, for this function of the slepton mass and the two neutralino masses. <coughs> I'm still not saying it's that easy to, to pick out all the pieces, but this is the kind of thing that you do. So you will try to figure out what the masses are for all these things in the decay chain. See if it makes sense. I mean, it may not even make sense because it may not be the correct model. But if it does make sense, then I guess you could say it might almost be like model building, where Matt was saying you might try 100 times and you might fail 99. And you'll be very happy if you get it one time. Actually, that's more positive than what he said, and I'll leave it there, <laughs> if you remember. OK, now implicit in all of these distributions that I've been, been showing you is that there's some sort of pre-selection done. There's some sort of intent to look in certain samples where we expect the new physics to be. And what are some examples of where these regions of interest might be? Well, things that are very high ET, as we said. So very high total event energy looking at these kinematic distributions will, will help focus on that new physics. Um, looking in the tails of the distribution, well, that's kind of the same as what I just said, the high ET. Looking at the high missing ET, in other words, if you have high missing ET, that might be a sign that you have these invisibly, um, in, invisibly produced uh, LSPs. Okay? So in all these cases, what you can do is you can focus on the specific subsamples and then do your work in those subsamples. An example of the subsample is that effective mass plot that I first showed you. You might have seen the, the tagline that said, after requiring four high PT jets and large missing energy, then you get that effective mass plot. If you don't make those sort of pre-selection requirements, then you're stuck looking at all the data. And all the data includes all the QCD production, all the jet production. And, and you're just going to be swamped with all that standard model rate and you won't be able to see your physics bump. The bump will still be there, but it will be so small compared to the number of events that you have from standard model that will be hard to see. So you really need to do a kind of a two-step approach to, to look at these combinatorics. 
And the problem is that looking in all these different subregions, subsamples, can be pretty tiring. So if there were a way to do it automatically, that, that would be pretty nice. So CMS in particular have a nice program to do this. It's called the, the music program. And the music program will try to do these things more or less automatically. It's the same thing that it's the same technique that had been used at some older experiments, the H1, D0, and CDF experiments. And it basically works like this. You have some notion of what some interesting subsamples might be. So I might say, aha, an interesting subsample to me would be a high PT lepton and a high missing energy, missing transverse energy, and a jet. Okay. Why is that interesting? Because you know it might have something to do with top. So T prime, for example, might break down to WB if it doesn't have anything else to decay to. And so that would look like a lepton plus missing ET plus a jet. Okay. So I can make up all these sort of different samples and let the computer program go through through each one of these different regions and make all sorts of distributions, like the effective mass distribution, like the dilepton invariant mass distribution. And then it will come back and tell me whether it found anything interesting in the, all those subsamples. In fact, it will do more than that. It will say, these are the 10 most interesting subsamples, the top 10 list. Okay? And then the physicists can go back and they can look at those top 10 lists and say, ah, okay, that's not really very, that's, that's just a small effect. Or, aha, I forgot to put something in the simulation. That's why it looks different than the data. So what's happening is this program is automatically comparing what's expected from the standard model against what we see in the detector. Now, there's one big challenge in all of this. The really big challenge in all of this is to try to describe all of the standard model at once in your computer program. That's where the problem is. If you could focus, and usually we do focus on something like, I will, I will focus on describing the standard model dilepton invariant mass distribution. Right? I can focus on that distribution and I can figure out exactly what I expect from standard model. But then imagine if someone said, aha, well, I'd like to look at the lepton, lepton, gamma distribution. And so then you look at that distribution, and it may or may not fit even after you carefully fixed this uh, dyed lepton invariant mass distribution. So looking at all these at once is very ambitious, but it's also very powerful. It has the potential to really let you peer into corners where you might not before. Okay. I'm sure you all know the story about the person looking for his keys. Don't stop me if you've heard this story. So the 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 policeman came along and saw a man looking for his keys and uh, under a street light. And the policeman says, what are you doing? I'm looking for my keys. He says, well, where did you, where did you lose them? He said, well, over there somewhere. Well, why are you looking for them under the street light? Because the light is better here. <laughs> so in some ways, I, you know, I hope that we don't fall into this trap here. We have our ideas about where we'll find the new physics, but if they turn out to be away from the light, or if we don't have enough lights to light up the whole, the whole street and look for the new physics, then we might miss it. So programs like this can help shine the light into the dark corners where they might not be uh, seen otherwise. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the obese Higgs. This is to follow up with what Matt was talking about this morning. And um, yeah, we can see if there are any more questions about this. So obese here means far beyond what we were talking about with the 200 or 300 GeV Higgs. Even thinking about what happens if the Higgs is up at five or 600 or even higher than that GeV. So if you look in the Higgs Hunter's Guide, I think that they call this the, the obese Higgs. Although if I recall, the obese Higgs for them was something like 150 GeV. It was, it was low, wasn't it? Because at the time, the Higgs was thought to be pretty low. Um, so Matt mentioned about the width of this morning. If you consider a uh, Higgs mass that is up around 1 TeV, if that's, you know, we have some considerations telling us it really has to be below 700, but, but let's say it's on that order, then we would be considering a width for the Higgs that's about half a TeV. And at that point, that's a pretty wide resonance for that particle. That's a pretty wide width for that particle. And that will make it very hard to pick out of any sort of distribution. Why do I say that? Remember that one of the keys for us picking out Higgs to gamma gamma is that we had such a sharp peak in the invariant mass distribution for the two photons. So let's say, for example, let's look at the, um, the uh, four lepton invariant mass. Okay? So this is the, the case where the Higgs decays through ZZ to four lepton. 
the so-called golden channel. We said that if you're at relatively low mass, that you get a nice peak like this. And you can see that peak falling on the spectrum, falling on the invariant mass distribution like that. Very easy to pick out. So let's say that instead of that, you have something that's spread out over a very wide region. Even if the rate were the same, which by the way, it's not because the, pr the production cross-section falls with the mass. Remember that pr production cross-section plot? So the production cross-section is falling with the mass, so the heavy Higgs or the obese Higgs will have a lower cross-section than this 200 or 300 GeV, and it will be spread out on top of the standard model background. So that's very hard for us to find. So let me take it a step further. I'd ask the question, I don't actually know the answer to this question, maybe some of the audience does, should we still call it a particle if it's 5 TeV wide and it has a mass that's uh, on the order of a TeV? I think this is one thing that maybe Matt was getting at this morning when he was talking about the scattering. Was, was that what you were thinking about for a very obese Higgs? What, what happens when something is so wide that you, you, you can almost not even think about it as a particle anymore? Yes, exactly, the case of the sigma. So you know that something is there, even if it's very, very wide. Right? And I'll show that in just a second here. So the, the, you might say to yourself, well, the other thing that's happening is the detector resolution is getting worse. Remember that we talked about how the detector resolution was somehow scaling as a function of energy. It turns out that a very, very high electron energies, electron and photon energies, that we reach some sort of constant term in our calorimeter resolution. I told you that it goes as 1 over square root of E. Well, that's not quite true. Okay, it goes as 1 over square root of E, and then at some point it becomes flat. It flattens out. So in other words, there's a 1 over square root of E term, and then there's the constant term. And so for the, the Atlas experiment in particular, excuse me, the constant term is on the order of 10%. If you do the calculation with the, if you think back to the tracking detectors we had where we calculated what the resolution for the muon should be, we said that we would like to get a 10% a resolution on a 1 TeV muon. That's what Atlas has. So it's about 6% resolution on a 500 GeV muon. And you notice that these detector resolutions are nothing compared to the physical width there. So these detector resolutions might limit you in your search for other resonances but they're not the limiting factor in the Higgs search at those high masses. It's the physical width of the Higgs, the theoretical width of the Higgs, that really is the, the limiting factor there. What can we do, though? Can we do anything? So here's my version of the W scattering that you saw this morning from Matt. So we, we heard, well, we didn't see exactly the unitary is violated in the WW scattering at the 1 TeV scale. And if we measure the invariant mass of the WW system, even though we have two neutrinos, if we can figure out a way to do it, uh, we can try to measure or actually try to plot the invariant mass of these, of these leptons that come out of the scattering. And we may see some sort of peak there that indicates the scattering is taking place, and we can measure the rate at which that happens. Another proposal that people have had is to say, let's take the case where only one W decays leptonically. So we'll have one lepton, one lepton neutrino, and then the other W decays hadronically to two jets. So then we have, we know that the missing energy comes from the, that first W, and we have a measurement of both Ws. So this WW scattering from the experimental point of view, uh, so the signal we saw this morning, and I've drawn a kind of a, a muck there to show that something is happening, and this is the thing that we actually want to measure. Uh, versus the background that we would have for the WW scattering. So the background looks like W emission off of these initial partons, but then with some extra, possibly some extra uh, jets. Oh, actually, look, I had a bad cut and paste. These are the high energy forward jets. And the way that you can tell that is that these are maintaining basically the same momentum as the incoming parton. So there's a radiation of a W, which gives a transverse kick to that original parton, and then it comes off like this. This will, 
then hadronize into a jet, radiate and hadronize into a jet. So two forward jets, and by forward I really mean one forward, far forward, one far backward. Over here I should have said central jets, possibly, high energy central jets, actually they don't even have to be high energy. And then I guess in this case it's not exactly clear where the leptons would end up. The, the yeah, that's a simulation that you'd have to do. Okay. But what do you see? You see if you really have some sort of resonance that the W scattering is proceeding through, you can see these sort of resonance uh, resonances around one TeV. And this is analysis that people have tried to do, tried to prepare for doing. The problem is that this takes a lot of data to do this. And in fact, doing this WW scattering, as Matt mentioned, is very hard. It's one of the main motivations for the super LHC, which is an upgrade that's planned to increase the luminosity of the beams of the LHC by factors of, actually by factors of just over two from the design luminosity. So it would be 10 to the 35 instead of 5 times 10 to the 34. So that's one of the main motivations for that. You need a lot of data in order to do that. And that would be a natural way to try to find out what's going on if we don't get some answers for the symmetry breaking at the first phase of the LHC. Okay. So any questions about this stuff so far? No. So for the kinematic edges and things like that? So I want to I want to emphasize that these kinematic edges are things that are still being developed, but they really will be applied only when we have some data to which to apply them. I mean, people will be looking first for the, any sort of hints of new physics, so that when again we can start to zero in on what happens after that. Okay, and so the the plan is is this: the plan is to look for these first signs of new physics, whether they be in the resonances for the leptons or the die jets, or the photons, or the effective mass distribution showing a shoulder like that. But in order to, to find resonances or to, to find these effective mass distributions, these bumps like this, we need to make sure that we understand what's happening with the TT bar, the W plus jets, the Z plus jets, the QCD. If somehow this prediction that comes from simulation in our, our Monte Carlo generator programs is shifted, in other words, it should actually be this way, but we're fooling ourselves into thinking that it's back here by, by 500 GeV. Then that would hide any sort of new physics. Or even worse, it might fool us into thinking that there's new physics there. So what we're trying to do is trying to be very careful at first to measure all of these standard model processes, to measure TT bar, to measure W plus jets and Z plus jets and the QCD production. So the things that we'll be able to discover at the beginning are things that are striking signatures, that are very pure signatures. So something like a lepton resonance or a die jet resonance once we've calibrated the jet energies. And the effective mass distribution, something like this, will be sensitive if it's a very striking signature. If it's a very small shoulder on the edge of the standard model distribution, then we'll have to be careful and ask ourselves whether there's any sort of systematic uncertainty in our calibrations that we might have whether we're really sure the distributions of these standard model events and wh or whether it really is in fact new physics. So that's something that more data can help us with and more precise standard model measurements. So you'll hear a lot of your experimental friends saying that these days we are trying to rediscover the standard model. And that's what they mean. We're trying to remeasure what we expect to get for TT bar for the W plus jets, the Z plus jets, and the QCD. And that is an interesting job in itself. It's interesting because we learned about PDFs yesterday. And the PDFs that are being used at the LHC, or let's say the, the X that we are probing at the LHC, has really never been probed before. I mean, we've never had a machine, the energy of the LHC. So we've never probed these very low Xs when we produce the Z bosons, or when we produce W plus jets events. And so this is all new to us. We think that we understand how these things evolve, how the PDFs evolve. We think that we have a pretty good prediction. But we may be wrong by, I don't know, a factor of two. I don't think we're probably wrong by more than a factor of two for sure, and probably much less, but you never know. So this is why we're trying to do all these things at the very beginning. And only then will we be sure that there is a, that there's some new physics after we do those searches. Okay. So one of my favorite quotations about these searches is supposedly from Confucius. I don't know if it's really from Confucius or not, but he says, 
It's very difficult to find. One of the hardest things is to find a black cat in a dark room, especially if there is no cat. Okay. <laughs> So sometimes that's how I feel. We're, we're doing all these things, and they're hard enough as it is, and then to have somebody tell you, well, it actually might not even be true. Okay. That's the experimentalist life. OK, are there any questions? That's all the slides I had, so I'll take any questions. So Well, I mean, that's something that you would just measure. For example, we may measure WW scattering and find that it, uh, what would we find? I guess it blows up if it's, if it's not unitary. No, actually, you know what we'd probably find? We, we won't find that it, you know, I don't think that we find it will blow up. We'll probably measure something, and whether or not it agrees with the theory is the question. Yeah, right? Well, so what I should say, and here I'll, I'll take my out as an experimentalist. We measure, we don't really measure unitarity, okay? Sure. Unitarity is your construct. We actually measure the scattering, right? Right, so we measure the scattering cross-section. If the scattering cross-section doesn't agree with what's predicted by quantum field theory, then that's a problem, not in the experiment necessarily, but in, in the quantum field theory. So we believe we can measure the W cross-section. We believe it will take a lot of data. And so that's one of the main motivations, like I said, for getting this huge increase in the, in the number of events in the data set. But it, it's a very good question. And, and for a lot of these things, you say, well, you know, how do you measure that in the experiment? I mean, to, really what we measure is we measure these rates. We measure the angles between things. We measure the invariant mass distributions. And, and that actually proves my point. We're not necessarily measuring a neutralino mass. We're measuring the mass of two leptons, or a lepton plus a, a photon. And so we can interpret that in these different models in different ways, and we have to try to figure out which one is the right one. That's what makes it hard, right? So for things like the Z, we say we're measuring the Z. We're really measuring the invariant mass, and then the Z is, is our explanation for that. Boy, was that nihilistic enough for you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't mind you asking that question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but you know, let's let's do the history for everyone, shall we? So at, at LEP2, the signature was this. So E plus E minus through a Z off shell and Higgstrelung. So H Z. And through various decay channels, Higgs going to B B bar. Uh, tau tau actually those are the only two Higgs decay channels and then the Z is going to Q Q bar L plus L minus even new new bar Okay, um, some slight excess of events which I think I said yesterday was 2 point something sigma 2.26 in my head for some reason I don't know if that's right or not most consistent, although not completely consistent, with a Higgs mass of 114 GeV. That's kind of where things stood at the end of LEP. So for those of you who weren't uh, in physics in those days, the decision was taken in 2000 to not run LEP anymore, to not try to see if these data would turn from a two sigma result into a three sigma result, but to, well, can you guess why they wanted to, uh, to shut down LEP and remove the LEP magnets from the tunnel? They were, they were getting ready to build something else, okay, which is the LHC. So that was the decision that was taken. Okay, so now we said that. So 114 GeV, from what you've seen from these lectures, how will we look for 114 GeV Higgs? Anybody have the notes? Okay. Go back to your branching decay, branching fraction plot, and what does the Higgs decay to at low mass dominantly? So, okay, BB bar, we said BB bar was going to be hard, but maybe we could do BB bar 
in the WH or the ZH channels, but pretty hard. What else? Two photons. Two photons, OK, so two photons. So if you go back and look at the two photons in your plot, I don't remember what I said, how much uh, integrated luminosity would be needed for the two photons, but, but that's the idea. So two photon and possibly some BB bar. We forgot one, which is tau plus tau minus, right? There's work being done on that, too. So the plan is to combine all of these together at 114 GeV. You remember that this one here was the substructure of jets. Okay, so we, people are coming up with new ideas all the time about how to access this. And by the way, Tevatron is also working on it. So I haven't really said too much during these lectures about the Tevatron, but that's another, that's another Hadron Collider. They've accumulated almost 10 inverse femtobarns of data in each one of the experiments there. So um, unfortunately, they're not able to exclude this 114 right now either. And the reason for that, I don't think I'm giving anything away. You can see it from the plots if you look at it. But evidently, there's a small excess of events in the Tevatron data also at 114 GeV. But I should emphasize it's within the one sigma that you would expect from the background. Just maybe a fluctuation. OK, so, so I'm not going to answer the question about when we'll be able to do that, because I think it's still a, a little bit of a moving target. It's a moving target because as we learn what we know and we don't know about the standard model backgrounds, that number could go up or down about how many inverse femtobarn it will take. And if people have good ideas or clever ideas, it may even go down. So it may, but I think that the Oh, so I don't think it will be six months. <laughs> <laughs> well, why? Let's, let's think about why. So the reason is that um, all of these were basically requiring us to do some sort of standard model fitting from the data. So something like uh, gamma gamma. Remember, we can only do gamma gamma because we know this very smooth distribution for the background, and then we can see the Higgs peak. Do you remember my Higgs peaks from yesterday for Higgs to gamma gamma? Remember how I said they were multiplied by a factor of 10? Okay, so you can go back and get a picture of that. Here for, excuse me, tau plus tau minus, it's, uh, the challenge here is making sure that you find the taus, so you have to take into account the tau efficiency. But also, if you do use the vector boson effusion process, that process has a lot lower production cross-section than the standard gluon fusion. So then you're hit there. I mean, unfortunately, it, it is true that these, this mass range is arguably the, the most difficult for LHC. I don't think anyone would argue about that. Uh, once you get up near, or once you get up close to the, the W mass, then you can use WW, and then you can use the golden channel ZZ. But for this low mass Higgs, it is challenging. OK, so that's a good question. I know I don't have a, a, a scalar number answer for you, but. You know, it's not clear that six more months would have done anything. Yeah, that's not clear at all. Tom? Well, so have you seen Tau's? Have we seen Tau's? That's a good question, Tom. I don't think we have any public results on the Tau's. Or, or we, anything with any flavor. What do you mean by flavor? Um, so, so for bottom, we have some events that uh, have secondary vertices in them. So we're able to find secondary vertices. And remember, that's a signature of, of a bottom. So we don't have any measurements that are specifically for bottom, but absolutely, we can see the secondary vertices that are tracked by the vertex detector. We see those. Let me tell you where we're at right now. So the, the results that are coming out right now are results on this bread and butter, um, very high cross-section interactions, things like measuring what's the interaction rate for uh, the protons to interact. Things like measuring what is the underlying event. I mentioned that's one of the main measurements so far. And very recently, um, starting to measure the cross-section for W and Z production. So in other words, we have nearly 100 W events, and we have a handful of Z events. Just in the ATLAS experiment, I'm sure CMS also has. So those two combined together give you some pretty pictures to look at. Okay. And then some of the distributions are really telling us valuable information about what the jet shape is. So we can measure what the jet shape is and how the energy falls off as you move away from the core of the jet. 
just based on the, the radiation that you have in the parton shower. So all these things are, are coming out, they're trickling out. I just got news today that the, the LHC will be, next. This, the next beams will not be until June 24th. So people are taking their time. Well, I've been telling some of you that uh, people are taking their time for a good reason. This is actually a dangerous machine. You remember from the first, the first slides that I showed, the total energy stored in that machine, at design energy to be sure, was one gigajoule. One gigajoule, okay? So one gigajoule, if you think about it, if that somehow that discharged, that could be even greater than the 1.21 gigawatts in Back to the Future. <laughs> right? A lot of, lot of energy. So the, the thing is you really have to be careful because the beams of that energy, even these um, few number of bunches that we have now, can really do damage. And so people are being very careful about making sure all the safety systems are in place before they put more protons in the beams because it, it you know, would only take one accident to, to drill a hole through some component of the accelerator. We don't want that to happen. So we're very patient as long as we're safe. Right? <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, one more here. You know, that's a good question, and I, I regret, the question was what, what is Atlas going to measure during the heavy ion um, physics? So I, I, in these lectures, you notice I focused very strongly on Atlas and CMS and the high PT physics, the, the, the physics run that's happening now. And you could have another whole set of lectures on heavy ion physics, you could have another set of lectures on the B physics that will be done at LHCB. Um, I'm afraid I don't know too much about the heavy ion physics, and that's a, a gap in my knowledge. Um, there is a plan to have a heavy ion run immediately following this high energy run. Um, and so I don't have any information about when that will be or what exactly is planned to, to, to happen there. November. November of 2010. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.